questions. So firstly, thank you all for taking time to come and center these lived and local experiences today. I'm really um, pleased to have these amazing panelists with us. Um, so my name is Quincy Wansell. I'm the Youth Programs Coordinator at Alice Paul Institute. Um, again, thank you for joining us for Champions of Equality. So um, Champions of Equality is a series of conversations with activists, artists, and academics, and educators on people in the past and present who have made an impact on the fight for gender equality. Um, this installment is going to explore Black women in history who have liberated themselves and others told through vignettes of Hattie Reckless, Charity Still, Sojourner Truth, and others. Um, I really just want to cement how important it is to preserve and honor Black history, um, as well as sharing it. The past, present, and future are not separate and seemingly untouchable sections in our lives, but they are connected by a through line of all of us and our personal and shared lived experiences. Oral history and storytelling are foundational in Black culture, so when we hold spaces like this, we go back to our roots. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really grateful to have our amazing panelists here. Before I introduce them, I'd like to just do our land acknowledgement. This is specific to South Jersey and the land that Paulsdale um, or Alice Paul Institute is on. The land on which we gather is a part of the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape, known as Lenape Hoking. The Lenape people lived in harmony with one another on this land for thousands of years. During the colonial period and early federal era, many were removed west and north, but some also remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. The Nanticoke Lenni Lenape Tribal Nation, the Ramapo Lenape Nation, and the Powhatan Lenape Tribe. We acknowledge the Lenape people as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our presenters. Um, Linda Shockley, um, she is the president of the Lawnside Historical Society, which owns the Peter Mott House um, Underground Railroad Museum. She is a native of the borough and a founding member of the Historical Society. She holds an undergraduate degree in journalism and worked for 32 years as a newspaper reporter, editor, and media foundation administrator. Her passion for local history began listening to Black History Week talks each February by the Lawnside Public School physician and archivist Roscoe, Roscoe L. Moore. Michiko Quinones is a founder, uh, the founder, co-founder, excuse me, and director of public history and education at the 1838 Black Metropolis. She has been a docent for over a decade at the both at both the African American Museum in Philadelphia and the Rosenbach Museum. She holds a BA in African American Studies and Government from University of Maryland College Park, an MS in Conflict Analysis and Re Resolution from George Mason University, is near completion on an MA in Museum Studies from Harvard University. Her true love and focus of study is the Black community of the antebellum in Philadelphia. In this vein, she has been resurfacing the achievements of this community through various formats, walking tours, online exhibitions, blogs, papers, lesson plans, conference presentations, and public talks. She is a co-founder of the Black Docents Collective and a co-host of the Philly People Now Deceased podcast, which surfaces untold biographies of Philadelphians. Her love of Philadelphia extends to photography, where she takes pictures of the architecture of Philadelphia on her phillyphotos.art website. And last but not least, Kenya Clay. She graduated from the University of Delaware with a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering and currently works at a local energy consulting firm as a senior energy engineer. Her spark for history began from sitting on the front porch with her grandmothers and hearing stories of the past from family and friends who stopped by to visit. Since the passing of her grandmothers within the same year, she has pursued a passion project to document her family history through interviews and research, which has inspired others to also explore the stories of their ancestors. She currently serves as a volunteer and secretary of the Dr. James Still Historic Office Site and Association. She is also a Still descendant and hopes to spread awareness of this rich local history. The Dr. James Still Historic Office Site Association is a 501c3 dedicated to teaching, restoring, and preserving the legacy of Dr. James Still and the Still family. 
The Dr. James Still Historic Office Site is a New Jersey State Park located in Medford, New Jersey, and consists of over 20 acres, which include the Visitor Center, Natural, Tra Natural Trail, and Dr. Still's original office. So without further ado, um, let's go ahead and start with Michiko. Um, I'll pass the mic over to you. Okay, thank you. That was a beautiful introduction. And I, I just got to say, I'm honored to be uh, on this panel with um, these incredible women. Um, and so I'm, it's just a pleasure for me to be here today. So thank you for that. Um, so we're talking about women who free themselves. And um, I wanted to start with, uh, you know, I, my focus is on Philadelphia as a, a center of a, what we call a like a black nation. And then we have regional, uh, on the, you know, regional connections out into sort of like the suburbs of, of this black nation. And, and that's how we think about it in the black metropolis. So Hetty Reckless is someone who started in the suburbs and came into the city. Um, and what we're, what she did was um, she was actually born in Salem. And um, at the time she was born, she was, she was enslaved and the, she was um, the enslaver family was the Johnson family. And this is the house that she was enslaved in. And this house is still in Salem. They moved the house to the middle of the city. Um, and as you can see, it's part of the steps for freedom. So if you wanted to retrace this yourself, uh, you can go to go to that, that site, visit, visit Salem County, and you'll find these underground railroad sites that you can go visit. Um, so the story is that when, when um, uh, Robert Johnson's mother was on her deathbed, she, um, was, she uh, manumitted Hetty and that it was, you know, when you had the gradual ab abolition laws, if, if someone manumitted you uh, as they were passing, that was, that word was bond and she was supposed to have been freed. But, um, and there was a witness to this, but then when the uh, mother died, the um, son refused to free Hetty. So this is when she's in her 20s and she knows that she's supposed to be freed, but she is kept enslaved by the son indefinitely. So another 12 years later, she finally decides that she's gonna take her freedom. And we think that part of this reason was that the Johnsons were incredibly um, violent. Uh, I mean, it is still enslavement, uh, just enslavement itself is violence. But then on top of that, there was even more violence, so much so that the local religious community took out a pamphlet against um, against Johnson because of something they had heard that had happened. And they, they put these words into this pamphlet uh, and they actually printed it out publicly. So this is a public shaming of this man. For I have been credibly informed that you rise from your family prayers to damn your Negroes, your poor half naked, half starred Negroes, because they will not anticipate all your wishes. And if it possible, do your work before your plans are matured. Now for this to have gotten into publishing, who knows how bad it really was, but this was the environment that Hetty was in. Now we know that there were gradual abolition laws, but that did not mean that everybody was free. And so when we get to, you know, about 1810, there are still quite a few enslaved people in, in New Jersey. Now this picture is from the state government and it does show that there's sort of this East West Jersey, we will call it North South Jersey, but back then they called it East West Jersey. And you can see that in the Southern area where we, we have Lawnside, where we have the stills, where we have sort of a, a large infrastructure of free black towns, there's a lot more free people here. And this is where Hetty was. She was down in this free area. So she decided one day to take a stagecoach. So she just got on the stagecoach. Now, there she knew, uh, as probably many other people did, that in Philadelphia, there were legal protections for freedom seekers. So you could go to the Pennsylvania Abolition Society um, and you could state your case and they would start to 
and engage in in the laws. And so we think that what she did was just get into this, you know, one day she just hopped on this uh, stage and went right in. It probably took her about a couple hours to get to Philadelphia. And we know she did this in 1825. Immediately when she got there, this letter's in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. She meets with the Abolition Society and um, she gives her story. Um, and she talks about how the wife of Robert has been so harsh to her. Amy is severe. Uh, the Let's see, the wife of Robert used Amy... Uh, used Amy severely, having knocked two of her teeth front teeth, two of her front teeth out with a brush handle, and on other occasions pulled handfuls of her hair from her head. So she was being abused, and she went and she told the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, this becomes now a legal document to offer her protection. Then later on, um, in 1826, we see that she has another letter that comes from the Pennsylvania Abolition Society directly to um, Salem. And they're trying to find, and they're trying to state the case that she's going to be protected. It's a way for the Pennsylvania Abolition Society to say, listen, we're trying to get in touch with you. Here is our case. Amy says that she, she had freedom right? It was, it was done by her, her mistress. And so that's where we're standing. In other words, we're going to protect her. Now, it wasn't just the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. It was the full free Black community of Philadelphia, which was um, quite extensive. So um, well, you all may have heard of the Seventh Ward, but I want you to think that the Seventh Ward didn't even exist until 1854. So this is 30 years before that, and, and this is primarily uh, west of 7th Street. But what you think now of Society Hill and Washington Square West, that was a Black neighborhood. And within that area, there was a huge concentration sort of settled around Mother Bethel. And according to the census that was taken of the free Black people in 1838, there were 18,768 free black people in Philadelphia in 1838, but we think there were more because there were freedom seekers who did not want to put their name down on the census. So the that community had $40 million in wealth and that's in today's dollars. 64% of the students of the children attended schools, 64% were unemployed, 600 black owned businesses or advanced trade people, 80 beneficial societies, most of which had about 200 members, 23 public or private schools and 16 churches. So this was a city within a city. And had it been in the top 20, it would have been larger than both Buffalo and St. Louis, black or white together. So that I want you to start thinking of this as a bright hub, a center, a, tra a black transatlantic center. And that's why we think about it as a nation with these regions around it. And just to give you an idea, what she was doing um, and the abolition activism that was happening. We we have, this is, we have kind of this, um, I'm not going to say that the Pennsylvania Abolition Society's white allies were completely perfect. They still had their own version of racism, even though they were doing the good work, they would not, for example, integrate friends centers, right? So there was always these kind of white and black efforts for emancipation that would work together, but not like all together. Um, we hope that maybe that was starting to change with Pennsylvania Hall, but you see what happened there. So um, 1775 and 1787, we start to see the birth of these kind of, like I said, a white organization, a black organization. Free Africa Society is the first beneficial society um, that, well, actually we now think there was a woman's Africa, uh, free Africa society a little bit before this, but anyway, they start, then we have the churches begin in 1794, um, and fast forward a little bit, there's some civilization building here, school building, you know, people getting settled, businesses, we hit 1837, it becomes very clear that the volume of freedom seekers coming into Philadelphia is very high. The white and black Pennsylvania Abolition Society wants to take a legalistic kind of um, policy view 
on emancipation, but they don't have the resources to handle the social services needed for people coming in all the time who need food, shelter, water, and all those things. So the vigilance committee gets started. This is the first vigilance committee. And then there's another one in New York that starts. These are specifically for aiding freedom seekers. And this is the first one. The second one was the one we're more familiar with that started in the 1850s with William Still. The first vigilance committee, 1837. There were also female associations. So the Pennsylvania Female Anti-Slavery Society, which was mostly uh, elite black women and white women, including Lucretia Mott, and then the Female Vigilant Association, which was mostly non-elite and uh, a black women. And Hetty is moving between all of these. She's the only person who has been enslaved in the P Pennsylvania Female Anti-Slavery Society. She's the only person who can tell people who really understands what this is and what it what's what what that experience is and also what the experience of transitioning out of enslavement into some type of new world how do you do that she did it herself and so and she did it 10 years before this and now she's actively involved and in moving between these two groups so you'll see in the notes she'll walk over here she'll ask for money she'll turn around and in the notes here she's giving it to freedom seekers and then in 1842, she forms a, um, a shelter. Um, oh, I'm gonna go back specifically for black women. And we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. I wanna just talk about the volume of people. If you wanna go to Smedley's um, Underground Railroad in Chester County, this is where he brings up Hetty Reckless because he's coming into the city with 11 people and this is in 1841, and he cannot find a place for them. So he goes around that night and he counts. Well, he goes to every safe house. At that time, there were 12 safe houses with 168 people in one night. And he's trying to find home for the 11 that he has. So he gets in touch with Hester Reckless, which is what some they called her Hester, Hetty, Amy, she had all those front first names. And that is how he was able to find a place for these 11 people. So it just this gives you an idea of what the volume was, but also the importance that Hetty played um, in, that, in that work. And, and you see that <laughs> it says she's an elderly colored woman. So we, we know that this is a, she left in 1825. I don't know how she was super elderly by 41, but it's okay. That's what he thought. All right. Um, so she partnered with the Moral Reform Society to form to form this shelter by Black women for Black women. And that was right at 7th and Lombard. And um, William Still says in his book that he went to school. So they formed a school there as well, an infant school and an adult school. And he says that for in 1844, he went to the adult school to kind of improve his reading and writing. So we imagine that William Still and Hetty Reckless knew each other. This is important because, um, you know, uh, she formed it with Hetty, she formed the Moral Reforms Retreat with uh, Hetty Burr, another woman. And at that time you had these women's organizations that were taking in inmates and almost putting them in like a jail situation where they would be reformed. Um, and so you had something called the Magdalens and you may have heard of the Magdalen shelter. But according to April Haynes, Hetty Reckless's shelter was different. It departed from the Magdalen model and reframed moral reform is neither a dynamic rescuing nor a disciplining, but one of mutuality and connection. They say about 200 women came through and that Hetty Reckless would, you know, afterward they would be um, indentured and then she would go and check on them. So they might go out and typically on Quaker farms if they went outside the city. Um, and then this is a, a, basically this is a, how a lot of people also know Hetty Reckless is that the friends uh, printed a visit to the shelter 
and it's called the, an afternoon walk and in it they describe her as a short fleshy women woman so I'm like okay um but she also is this shrewd nonprofit leader makes me think about a lot of us women running nonprofits and how we tell our story in order to get money there's this woman that comes in uh, a woman who's uh has a child she's 17 um and hetty she comes in right when the Quakers are there and Hetty has to turn her away because there's not enough money. And so all of this gets written into this thing. And then in the next write up, they're asking for money. And I thought, hmm, that was pretty smart. I doubt, I doubt she actually turned that girl away. So anyway, I like to see that. I like to see that strategic agency. Uh, she, let's see. So Robert Johnson died in 1850. She went back to Salem and she continued to help with freedom seekers from Salem working. Uh, she lived in the Goodman, with the Goodmans, Amy Goodman. Um, and here's just a letter from Amy Goodwin to William Still talking about how Hetty has helped out and how much money has been collected for freedom seekers. So she was never legally manumitted, which means that she might be when she died. Um, and I think she died in eight, she died after emancipation which means that she never got manumitted, which means she might've been one of the last enslaved people in the state of New Jersey before emancipation. Okay, yep, so that's it. I'm gonna switch over now. Are you gonna take it, Quincy? Yeah, I will go ahead and share my screen. Thank you so much for that. Really, it's just <laughs> such an interesting life story of Hattie Reckless and just also how she's described um, and talked about is really eye-opening. Just kind of see how Black women in history have been represented in quote-unquote media or been described is um, just really interesting to see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share here. All righty. Well, thank you again. Like I said, I'm definitely honored to be able to speak on uh, charity for Sydney, which was uh, the name that she previously had. Um, just as a note, I am um, a descendant, but I'm actually um, part of the line of the first freeborn son in New Jersey. So, um, the importance of charity is, you know, pretty much this matriarch uh, contributed contributed to our own freedom. Like, who's the know? Who's to say where our family would be if she didn't escape? So, um, just wanted to give that little preview before I got started. Um, so, Sydney, I'll call her Sydney until she officially changes her name. But <laughs> um, Sydney was born enslaved. Um, in Caroline County, which is located in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And she was on the, um, in the same plantation as her mother and sisters. Um, while enslaved, uh, she actually witnessed her father get shot by um, a drunken slave owner. Uh, she was actually, excuse me, owned by uh, Saunders Griffin uh, down in Caroline County. Uh, there's no known record of her having any schooling, and actually, um, William uh, also mentioned that she didn't have schooling, so um, we're able to confirm that. And while she was enslaved, she was married to Levin Steele, who was not on the same plantation, um, but who was able to later purchase his freedom because of that. So um, I wanted to speak a little bit um, and read this note uh, based on conversations that uh, James still one of her sons wrote in his book about life growing up um, for her and her sister who she spoke with fondly. I'm going to take a minute to read that. Uh, they had to work in the field and plow corn and all manner of work that men usually pursue. In summer's heat and winter's cold, 
their task was required of them. They were meanly clad. There was no redress for the wrongs of which they almost regarded it a sin to complain. Their husbands were no protection in their duress, distress, excuse me, not daring to utter a word on their behalf. If they did, they would not be allowed to visit them. As was frequently the case, the husband belonged to one planter and the wife another. Therefore, the husbands were constrained to use the utmost good behavior in visiting their wives for fear of being prohibited from visiting them. Um, and he also goes on to say, schools to them were more sacred than churches as they were allowed to go to church, but never to school. Which I think speaks volume, just, you know, to put into perspective, you know, what life was like being enslaved um, and also having split families at that time. Uh, at, at this time, while she was enslaved, after she was married to Levin, uh, they had four kids. Uh, they t technically had five, but uh, the oldest and um, there's no, it's, it's not sure whether she passed away she, when she was younger or, but it doesn't like give, a, give like an end of life uh, further after she tries to escape. So pretty much they had five kids while enslaved and, uh, you know, were, were under this duress as a broken, not I won't say broken family, but a, a family that was separated. Um, now, Levin, his owner actually passed away and he was, uh, he was willed to the son. And in that they were around the same age and he was able to, uh, he was given the opportunity to purchase his own freedom. So he actually was manumitted in 1798 which was interesting because Levin then moved up north, um, but still kept in contact with charity and tried to provide aid, which was one of the main things that, you know, uh, not only seeing her father get murdered, right, um, due to negligence, uh, but also uh, just to reunite their family next. So what's very unique about Charity, or excuse me, I'll keep calling her Sydney for now, um, is that she actually escaped twice. Um, and the first escape, she had four kids. It was Levin Jr., Peter, uh, Mahala, and Katora. Now, at this time, Peter and Levin, they were under the age of eight. Uh, so they were about like, maybe five and seven and the girls were younger so they were you know speak says one was an infant and the other was maybe like two or three like a toddler so to put that into perspective too a lot of people don't uh think of uh women or whole families escaping with kids and babies a lot of times people just think of older people or adults running away no people were running away with you know if they are family with them a lot of times they tried to run away with their entire family. Um, so she made an attempt. She was determined uh, to meet up with Levin. And like I said, they were in communication and he was providing some assistance. And she escaped successfully and got into New Jersey, uh, actually in Salem County, there's Greenwich, which was known as um, a town where there were free Blacks as well as, uh, you know, some runaways. And they were able to reunite. So the family was reunited and together. But unfortunately, while Levin was out, slave catchers came and returned her and the four kids back to uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland. So with that, her owner was very much infuriated. And there's a note um, in William's narrative about her uh, that she was locked up or kept locked up at night in the garret. So for about three months, he actually kept her away for, from her kids, uh, locked up to teach her a lesson to, uh, I forget the exact wording that he used, but more or less to make sure that spirit was out of her, you know, that 
you know, pretty much make sure that she was docile, I guess. Um, but that in in reality just, you know, motivated her more. <laughs> I mean, when you really think about it, you know, um, that really just inspired her, like, I need to get out of here. So um after he felt that she was, you know, she had learned her lesson, she made a second attempt. But unfortunately, she made a really hard decision to leave her two boys behind. Like I said, they were the two older um, of the four. And also just thinking about all the um, abuse that happened to women in slavery. So she decided to leave the two boys and take her two daughters with her. So again, she was successful, which is amazing. Um, but you'll see here on the right, um, the first journey was from Caroline County, which is uh, just over the Delaware state line into Maryland. Um, she, they successfully got to Greenwich. And then the second time they went deeper into New Jersey and uh, settled in Shimon, New Jersey. Um, so there's a few things that actually made this escape successful. Like I said, she changed her name, which was one of the things. So they not only did they go deeper into New Jersey and anyone familiar with New Jersey and that part specifically, it still is like pretty much woods and not, not as developed as some of the other areas, um, but they settled there as well as she changed her first name from Sydney to Charity. And also there were already stills in the area um, in New Jersey and Southern New Jersey. So they took on that last name because like I said, Levin was, his last name was Steele, S-T-E-E-L, um, as written even on his manumission paper. Um, and then when they came into Shimon, they went under and we were grafted into the Steele family. Next. I actually do have a question. Sure. Uh, this one's for me. And folks, feel, feel free to ask questions in that Q&A chat feature there. Um, so, you know, while you were talking specifically on this, uh, on this slide, it just made me think about, you know, Black women in slave enslavement who had to make really tough choices. And so I was wondering, you know, I'm thinking also about Toni Morrison's Beloved, um, so could you maybe go into a little bit more depth about what, you know, what that impact, what it meant for, you know, specifically in this case, a Black mother to have to make a decision like this? And yeah, I mean, also Linda Michiko to answer as well. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, especially for charity, it was about survival as well, you know, um, knowing that she wanted to be free and hoping that she would be able to go back one day to go get her boys. Like uh, we have these narratives about Charity because her sons spoke about her, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's something where um, like some of the, the hardship was carried on and uh, lived on through her children, but also, um, just you know if she didn't do it that's where she she would still be enslaved and that would you know define the destiny of her kids um I will also add which something I meant to say is there's even um there's even a narrative in William's book where he mentions that um Katora, the youngest got sick and she, they actually left her um, with someone uh, along the way. So Levin had to go back to go get her just because traveling, you know, with infants basically and toddlers, it, like I couldn't imagine what that was like, like being in danger like that and being a fugitive. I mean, anything could have happened along the way, but there's actually a number of accounts documented by William Still in his Underground Railroad records of children, like babies, like um, either whole families or women with their children running away. Let alone abuse, which I can understand. I mean, I couldn't imagine um, 
having to make that hard decision to pick which kids you're you're going to take with you. But I I think it speaks volume to how tri- how women were treated um, in slavery compared. I mean, all bad. I'm not belittling that, but you know, the thought to take her toddlers, her her little girls, and you know, leave her boys. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so like I said, uh, Charity and Levin, they settled in Shimong, New Jersey, and, um, she went on to have, uh, more children in total. She claimed to have 18, which, um, were only able to confirm 14 that are documented, but that could have been stillborns or anything like that as well. Um, excuse me, her youngest son, William, which we've been talking about already <laughs> during this presentation, uh, he was an abolition, abolitionist, philanthropist, um, and uh, main conductor in Philadelphia for uh, the Underground Railroad and kept a book of secret records. And he was given the name the Father of the Underground Railroad in his uh, obituary in the New York Times or the Washington Post, excuse me. Um, but that just speaks to, like I said, the entire legacy of charity, which I always like to focus on because like I said, if it wasn't for her um, courage and determination to leave that situation, like to, you know, just go for it, um, who's to say where the rest of the family would be? Uh, but William, like I said, was the youngest. He was born in 1821. And uh, also, which is another amazing part, which I would love to share um, if we still have time. But um, so her two sons that were left behind while um, after she left, her owner was so furious that he sold them so she couldn't come back to find them. So they were sold to Kentucky or sold to a bricklayer or something in Kentucky and then sold deeper into the South later to Alabama. So unfortunately, the eldest, uh, Levin Jr., passed away while he was still enslaved. But Peter was also given the opportunity to purchase his own freedom, which he uh, kind of worked his, uh, <laughs> he, 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 pretty much found an advocate that was in the town um, to be purchased and then purchased himself. But he ended up also traveling up to uh, to Philly after he was able to purchase his freedom. And he met with William, who, you know, granted, they never met each other. I'm talking about two boys that were left behind in, um, you know, in slavery, and then the youngest. So that's, you know, 20 years difference <laughs> um but like I said he was enslaved and he was uh when he came through the abolitionist office uh Peter excuse me William had to convince him like I think you're my brother you know because he's mentioning about Levin and Sydney and who else would know that other than her own children to keep that family secret um because she was a fugitive and in 1850 uh, there was the Fugitive Slave Act that was passed, which was the pretty much seen as a compromise of 1850. Um, and that pretty much, that act or law made it so that way it was everyone's responsibility or all the citizens in the U.S. didn't matter um, anymore about the Mason-Dixon line to return any fugitives. Um, so it's interesting because like I said, Peter was enslaved for 40 years, so he had to get convinced um, <laughs> to actually go with William, with, with William, excuse me. But thankfully, within that same year in 1850, um, he was able to be reunited with Charity, which was a beautiful thing. Um, and he talks about, you know, she's in close to her 80s and um, he was you know, her other kids are like, you know, we don't want to startle her or, you know, cause her to go in shock or anything. And it was just like a beautiful account where, you know, her children came and um, he was able to sit next to her 
and her daughter who um actually it was Katora who actually you know said hey he looks really familiar is he related <laughs> which is like such a beautiful uh story so you know it was it was very um very I don't I can't even describe it like just the the I don't know <laughs> just having that opportunity for her to see her son again like that meant everything and then Peter also went on because like I said he was enslaved for 40 years he had a whole family in Alabama and he raised funds to purchase them you know to buy their freedom and she was able to also meet her grandkids through Peter and her daughter-in-law that she never met. So, um, and then um, near her end of life, she stayed with Samuel, which is the line that I'm in. Um, he was the first son that was born into freedom uh, in New Jersey. And then uh, she also stayed with James, who was known as the Black Doctor of the Pines. So he talks about how blessed he felt. And I mean, so much that um, he dedicated a chapter in his autobiography to her, um, that he was given an opportunity to help comfort her in her later years. Um, and the main thing that I also want to touch on is just um, the impact of a mother on a family. I mean, all of her sons, when you read their book, they speak so highly of her and how their the tone and their character just resounds through the writing you know having discipline um she was also known as a staunch methodist and singing church hymns while she's you know <laughs> cleaning or you know throughout the house and it just is interesting to see how that her character you know as well as Levin but you know just how she is spoken of so highly and so well regarded by her children um and even the expectation of um you know not being held back by um things around you that determination you know carried on through the generations and um as much so uh dr uh, excuse me Dr. James Still, his son, um, James T. Still, graduated. He was, I believe, like the third, um, the third African American to graduate from Harvard Medical School. Um, William Still's daughter was one of the first African American uh, female doctors in Philadelphia, or excuse me, Pennsylvania. And then also with Peter's kids, you know, um, one tried to uh follow the same uh herbalist method um or excuse me herbalist path and then uh was able to or try to provide some of his salve to the president president garfield you know it just is amazing to think of coming from nothing and uh, being so inspired and encouraged to uh be all that you can be <laughs> um but yeah I just wanted to share that that bit on on charity and I thank you guys for this time thank you so much Kenya that really is a beautiful story you know being reunited after all of those years and all the horrors of enslavement and traveling and changing your name being grafted into another family um and it also is very eye-opening about the different layers within slavery um you know being able as a black man to you know buy freedom for your family um and also you know there were black slave owners too um so just you know it's making me think about how many different moving parts there are to slavery and the way this family was able to succeed in the ways that they did and reunite um, as most as they can was, yeah, just really inspiring to hear. Um, there was a question here asked if the speakers could share titles of written resources that we can read on their topic. Um, in the email following up with you all, I will 
compile a list of resources for you and it'll be in there for your viewing pleasure. Um, okay, and now I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to Linda Shockley. Thanks so much. I really have enjoyed listening to uh, Michiko and Kenya. Appreciate everything that you've done in establishing the stories of the, of those women. So I'm going to talk about a, a probably obscure person in in Elizabeth Ann Mott, who was the wife of the Reverend Peter Mott, who owns the Peter Mott House Underground Railroad Museum, as we now call it here in Lawnside. We know precious little about Elizabeth Ann. We're really in search of research and information about her. As you can see at the top of the screen, there's a, uh, a sliver of the 1850 census that shows Peter and Elizabeth saying that they were born in New Jersey. They were um, 40 and 42 respectively. And this was the census in Center Township, which was where Lawnside uh, was situated. Now we do know from records that in Gloucester County's Historical Society that Peter married Elizabeth in 1833 there in Gloucester County. Camden County didn't come into existence until 1844. They moved to Snow Hill, uh, which is the name that once I was known by for uh, more than 100 years. And um, they purchased this property and he built this house. It's a two-story house. You need to come see it. It's a um, white clapboard at this time based on the information that we gathered from resources paint analysis and assistance with the New Jersey Historic Trust in restoring the house. The State Historic Preservation Officer said for an, a Black man to own a house of that size in the 19th century indicates that he was a man of stature. So he was the first Sunday school superintendent at Mount Pisgah African Methodist Episcopal Church. One of the other things that we've been told is that when you have African Methodist Episcopal uh, churches in close proximity to uh, the Society of Friends, abolitionist activity is most likely to take place. And so we know that many of the people in our community uh, have roots in having been enslaved by friends in Haddonfield and the Haddonfield area and also having been helped by the free black people themselves. We always like to explain that the Underground Railroad starts with the agency of the enslaved person who decided they want to be free. And so that's what they did. I have there the death certificate um, for Elizabeth. So it gives a, a little bit of her background, her parents' names. We know parents' names. We know nothing like that um, for Peter. If you look at the little sliver of the census from 1870, you'll see that um, both of them are saying that they were born in Delaware or in Virginia. So when you have uh, students come, we like to ask them what happened in between 1850 and 1870. Uh, depending on their age and what they know, some can say, well, we had the Civil War. And so perhaps Peter and Elizabeth felt comfortable admitting that they were born in slaveholding states because we know New Jersey gradually uh, abolished enslavement starting in 1804. So, so that's pretty much what we know, except for oral histories where people have said that their relatives helped Elizabeth by cooking extra food and bringing it to her so that she could feed uh, the fugitives who were escaping. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about an owner or only judge. She was um, a daughter of an enslaved seamstress and a white tailor who was indentured at Mount Vernon. Now, uh, she was taken to Philadelphia and New York by George and Martha Washington so that um, she was 
working in the White House, um, the so-called Philadelphia White House. Now, it's interesting that people would say, oh, well, <clears throat> George Washington and Martha Washington pursued her because they loved her so much. She was like a daughter or like a child to them. They gave her fancy clothes and they gave her money to go to shows in Philadelphia. But also knowing that he had brought an enslaved person or a collection of enslaved people into Philadelphia, George Washington went about the process of rotating these folks back to Virginia um, so that they could never claim that they had enough longevity in a free state like Pennsylvania to claim their freedom or sue for their freedom. Now, one of the things that Oni heard was that it's possible that she would be given to Martha's Nee, uh, Martha's granddaughter, who was reputed to have a terrible temper and to be quite abusive. Um, she also realized that if she ever went back to Virginia, she would not likely be able to come back as a, and then as affect her freedom there. So what she did was run away while the family was eating dinner. She had packed her things, and with the help of three Black people in Philadelphia, she was able to make her way to a ship called the Nancy and sail. She wound up in New Hampshire, um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Now, she's a subject of a couple of books, Never Caught, by... Erica Armstrong Dunbar, and, and several children's books as well. Um, one of them is by Diane Turner, who is the curator of the Charles Bloxon collection at Temple University in Philadelphia. She rebuffed their pleadings and eluded capture. So there's a picture of an advertisement there. So, uh, the steward of the White House is offering $10 um, to anybody that would help uh, capture her, they suggested that she had been influenced by a Frenchman to run away. They couldn't imagine why she would leave. Now, years later, Oni would tell interviewers that she ran away because she wanted to be free. It was just that simple. And the other thing that she had vowed is that she would never be enslaved by this evil person, this granddaughter who was actually Martha's um, granddaughter, and that she and other enslaved people at Mount Vernon were really owned by Martha's family, and that if George lost, lost anyone, he would be responsible for reimbursing Martha's family. So the, the altruism, the angelic vision of this president uh, who could never tell a lie is kind of laid bare there with the story of Ona Judge. So she was never caught. You can go to the next slide. And so here's Isabella Bomfrey, also known as Sojourner Truth. She's such an extraordinary figure in American history. And um, as we heard so many times about her speech of ain't I a woman, um, it's become clear that the language that was used in it was really um, kind of fabricated to make her appear uh, more believable to certain folks. But she was um, very well suited as an itinerant preacher to speak and to speak effectively. She was born in Ulster, uh, upstate New York, which is, you know, we know New Amsterdam and the Dutch speaking area. Um, she was born as Il Isabella Bomfrey, but she took the name Sojourner Truth as a preacher. One of the, ex ex in addition to escaping herself, she also sued her enslavers for her son who had been sold 
to Alabama illegal out of New York. So assisted by the Von Wagner family, she was able to sue and to win the return of this child. So um, the Historical Society has just published uh, some, some stickers and one of them has um, Sojourner depicted standing in front of a courthouse and the other has her wearing a little button, which she probably wouldn't have worn a button, but advocating for the vote. She was a staunch suffragist without compromise. She thought it was important that women get the vote. And she actually fell out somewhat with Frederick Douglass because he thought it was more important for black men to get the vote before women. However, she was a peacemaker and a conciliatory person. And so she tried to bring together the factions even among the women suffragists who exhibited some racist behavior and separatist behavior, putting the importance of white women being able to vote before that of black people. There was not that primary discussion about um, black women getting the vote so much as white women and black men getting that position. She was honored for her work during the Civil War. Um, she was a staunch supporter of the Freedmen's Bureau, and she continued to be a beacon. And that's why we celebrate her today. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank that's you. absolutely beautiful. Um, all of you are just such great storytellers. I'm just like sitting here totally enthralled by these stories. Um, and I just want to go back quickly to um, Martha Washington and Ona Judge. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because they say, you know, her granddaughter, she had a temper and she could be nasty, but that is so much more than just a woman with a bad attitude, right? This is a white woman who is able, she has the power to construct control within the domestic, domestic sphere of plantation life. And I think it's so important that while we, you know, we recognize the um, experiences of Black women while they're enslaved, I think it's also equally important to recognize that white men as slave owners were not like the only group to fear is also the women within the home had another layer. It was whether or not you were inside or you were outside, you still had to navigate a really tricky um, system of control um, and not at the time being able to define yourself and um, you know, prove your identity um, is just, yeah, that added layer onto it is really, yeah. it's uh, really important to yeah. note. So thank you for, for bringing that up about her granddaughter, because I think that that um, is a really big piece that we miss when we're thinking about experiences um, being enslaved. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, in some cases, you found even the spouse was complicit. Um, for instance, the story that William Still tells about Jane Johnson, who was accompanying um, the plantation owner, along with the children that she bore for him, to Nicaragua, where he was being appointed as an ambassador. And she comes to Philadelphia, and it is the wife of the owner who says, keep her infant to prevent her from running away. And, and that's where Lorene Carey hits on the novel, The Price of a Child, which was that one book on Philadelphia. And, and, and that really brought home to me mm -hmm. the, the complicity of, of the spouses in there. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we have a comment here from Erica Ryan. Stephanie Jones Rogers wrote They Were Her Property, a great book about what we're discussing now about, about white women's power over enslaved Black women worth read. Absolutely. Um, that's totally what I was thinking of um, when I was listening on. That is a great resource. I'm going to also list that um, in the email today for you all. So um, we have just a few minutes. If we have any last questions, um, I do have one that I would like to ask both of you. I think we lost Michiko. Um, but my question for you is when defining racism, why do many people ignore institutional racism? How can you challenge institutional racism today? Well, I'd like to say, I think it's harder for people to ignore, first of all, uh, people confuse prejudice with racism. Racism is, is uh, something that is is used by the powerful against people that have less power. It's not just I don't like you because your skin is brown or your nose is broad or or your or your eyes are blue. It's I have power to do something to you on the basis of my feeling about the threat that you pose to me or the superiority that I believe I possess, and so when we talk about institutional racism, then you have to dismantle an entire system. You can't just say, oh, well, so, well, it's people would say, well, I never owned slaves or my family never owned slaves or the federal government had nothing to do with slavery or I didn't, um, I haven't profited from this. When, when you start to go through the uh, abolition of slavery, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and then you see the introduction of the black codes, the dismantling and, the, and of the a reconstruction period and the systematic effort to discriminate in housing and education, uh, in employment, uh, to try to discourage people from leaving uh, the agricultural South, um, keeping them out of housing. Uh, you know, you could go right on up through the GI Bill and, and you know, the social services system, why aren't domestic African-American women, why weren't they included in, in the social security system? All of these things um, are just, we're just finding out the interconnections. And so it, it's a defense against, uh, no, there's no such thing as institutional racism. And so it's easier to to play it off. And it's, it's a problem with the person. It's a personal problem. It's not a systemic problem. Yeah. It's something lacking in the individual. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And one thing as I read more about um, different narratives, um, I was actually somewhat surprised how heavy um, people lean into the legal system, mm. you know, knowing the laws, knowing what their rights are, which I think is also something that uh, some folks could benefit today to actually take legal action and know it for themselves. I feel like a lot of people are taken advantage of and don't realize it and just accept it, even though they don't like it. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'll see any more questions here. I will finish off with the last question for you all. Um, and then we were clo we'll close out for today. So in the museum um, educator space, what's the most challenging aspect about bringing stories like these to the forefront? Hmm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm thinking of, you know, Elizabeth well, well, Thomas. Just, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, um, maintaining your um, empathy for the people that you're talking to, um, whether they're people who just don't know any better, um, or just don't know the facts, uh, wh whether you're dealing with children, um, different age groups, and then whether you're you're encountering people who are just downright resistant. I mean, you know, we have people that come and say, well, you know, um, <laughs> they learned how to farm here. They learned how to raise tobacco and how to, you know, cultivate cotton. And it's like, um, uh, I beg your pardon. People had great civilizations 
uh, before they came here. They had agrarian systems before they came here, so they knew how to do these things. They knew how to work with iron. They knew how to work with, with other metals. They knew how to work with herbs and uh, medicinal products. They knew how to immunize people against disease. So you, 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 can't, you can't get upset or excited um, at the same time as you try to uh, help people to learn and realize that they need to, to understand more instead of bringing their preconceived notions. You, you hit that on the head. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. I, I come across that quite a bit. I mean, especially um, sometime, you know, where we're located is out in Medford and, you know, we get all different types of visitors and, you know, people come with their own thoughts of what they were told or, you know, even their own belief system. So it's like, you know, making sure that you do stay empathetic about, you know, personal perspectives, but also still speak facts, right? And take the emotion out of it mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, it could still be conveyed, you know, appropriately. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, definitely, yeah, that's that's very true. I was meant to say it's not difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, the three of you for joining this all black panel today to really close out uh, Black History Month. But I also want to acknowledge that black history is American history and we shouldn't right. just reserve um, spaces like this and learning about our culture and history to just February. Um, uh, they should be integrated. I wish to see figures like um, Sydney and Elizabeth and um, Sojourner Truth more ingrained into our um, education. Um, we got a thank you in here from the chat. Um, C. Murphy, thank you so much, Erica. Um, please, please check out Peter Mott House alongside Historic Society. Please go to um, Dr. James Still historic site, and as well as check out the 1838 Black Metropolis. You can really access that online as well. Um, thank you all. Yes, I will, Catherine Shaw, I will list the links and names to everything in the resource email at the end. Um, thank you again. I appreciate you and your time, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks thank so you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.